If you want to do parking lot church again sometime for some other reason, let me hear a horn honk. Your forgiveness 
have led me through the fire in darkness. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have learned in the good. thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness, that Lord, no matter what kind of storms we may go through in life, no matter what kind of attacks may come our way, God, that we can rely on you 100% to know that you have our best interest in mind, Lord, that you love us more than we could ever imagine, and you have proven and demonstrated your love by allowing your son Jesus to die on the cross for us, despite our sinful nature, despite that we have offended you, you still allowed your son Jesus to die for us. And God, we thank you because you are good and you are faithful. And Lord, as we open up your faithful word, Lord, may it speak to us tonight, may it teach us, may it show us something new. As we look at something that may be very familiar, may we see something new tonight. And in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Joe, just so you know, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 is where we're going to be at tonight. If you have the FBC Edom app, which every one of you should, you can open up your FBC Edom app. You can go to sermon notes, and on those sermon notes, you'll be able to follow along and keep up tonight uh, in 1 John chapter 4. Um, but uh, as we get started, I, I want to just real quick, I'm going to, I told you I was going to do this earlier. I'm going to tell you real quick sort of what we have coming up, just so you're prepared, because this is the sort of end of the, uh, the, the, the parking lot worship for, for now. Um, I will say this, we have a parking lot event planned. That's July 4th. If you were part of our July 4th last year, that was a big deal. Um, and that's our biggest outreach of the year at FBC Edom is July 4th. 
we are still planning um, to have July 4th and have our Freedom and Edom gathering right over here uh, in the north side of the church in that parking lot over there. So you get to come, you get to park here, you get to walk over there, set out your lawn chairs. We will have, we'll have our band out there. We'll be playing music and we're working on a few other things. Um, normally we would have like water slides and stuff for kids. Water slides, maybe not so much. We're going to see. We got to we got to adjust a few things because of COVID nineteen this year. Uh, but we are still meeting on July fourth, and I hope that this year it's bigger and better than ever. Um, so make sure you have that marked down on your calendars. Um, but we are meeting back in the church on Sunday mornings. We have two worship times at nine and eleven. You just pick which one you want to come to, and you come. I do suggest. Um, if you can come to the nine o'clock, uh, the nine o'clock is usually less crowded. Now I would encourage you to come to that one because um, usually first time guests are going to come to the 11 o'clock. So that way we have more room for them. Um, so if you are somebody that is a you would consider yourself sort of a staple here at First Baptist Edom, um, you, you're here quite often. Choose the nine o'clock if you can. We understand if you can, but you do have two choices and, and we are doing our very best to follow social distancing um, and to keep you safe and COVID free. Uh, but we've got a lot of things coming up in the summer and our plans this week have sort of taken a shift um, because we have been planning and planning and planning and planning to go to camp, whether it be kids camp at Lake Lebon or senior camp at Falls Creek. And both of those this week, got nixed. Um, number one, Falls Creek, uh, who had readjusted their schedule and moved their senior camps to later in July, just came out and said, ah, we don't think that we can safely have student camp. So they canceled everything. And then today, Lake Levon, or really it was yesterday, but we made the decision today, put out their restrictions for campers and counselors. And for little kids, we thought it was a little excessive um, and we didn't really want to put our little kids through that. And so we decided that it would probably be better for us to come up with a better idea. Right now, we're working on those ideas. Um, I know we have a date um, for our, we're going to do a youth event. Um, it will probably be a retreat like camp. They'll be gone three or four days, just like they had planned for Falls Creek. Uh, we're working on exactly what that looks like, but it's going to be at the end of July, like July, I think, 27th through the 30th. So you can mark your calendars for that, but realize we'll let you know exactly what that looks like in weeks to come. And then the kids, they're looking at some other ideas and other options that maybe they probably stay a little closer to home, uh, but we don't have a date on that yet, but we have information coming really soon. So my encouragement to you is make sure you follow us on social media, make sure you check our website, make sure you have an app, make sure you're signed up for our emails. That's how you get all of the information. Um, those are the four best ways to get information from First Baptist Edom. Um, so I encourage you to make sure that you're getting all that information. All right, so let's open up our Bibles. John, 1 John. 1 John chapter 4 is where we're at. And uh, when we get in here, I want to talk to you a little bit, first of all, about the day and age that we're in. Now, I haven't really just sort of attacked all this COVID stuff, and I'm really not going to do it tonight. But I realize that the day and age that we live in, trying to identify the difference between what is fake and what is real is hard. And specifically, I'm even talking about news. I mean, every, every, inf every bit of information that we get, I don't care where it's from. You know, now my dad, me and my dad get in arguments all the time because, I mean, he is Fox News all the way. If you're Fox News, go ahead and go ahead, get it out of the way. Come on. Nobody's Fox. Okay, there you go. I know you Fox Newsers are out there. My dad's at home, hopefully right now watching, realize I'm throwing him under the bus. But I tell my dad, I said, Dad, how can you even trust Fox News? How, do we, how can we trust any, any news outlet today? We don't know what, what kind of information that they're giving us. We, we're having trouble verifying it. As soon as they give us one number, a new number comes out. We can't identify the difference between what is truth and what is fake? And really in our day and age, even not news, but just when you think of the technology we have, I think one of the most interesting things are those 3D printers. I don't know if you've ever had, if you have one or if you've got to play with a 3D printer, but man, you can create some really cool things with a 3D printer. And 
because of the abilities of that technology, you can create what is considered replicas of certain things. They look real, but they're really fake. And so in, in our day and age, and with the technology that we have, it is hard for us to distinguish the difference between what is real and what is fake, or what is true and what is false. And when you get into John chapter 1, verse 4, John is warning churches, specifically probably churches over in Asia Minor, he's warning them about false teachers, false doctrine, what they need to watch out for. But what I want to show you is one little portion of scripture in there that we love to quote. In fact, you're looking at somebody right now that loves to quote this scripture, and that's 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. And we don't even quote the whole thing most of the time. We just say the second part of it, which says, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. How many of you have ever honked if you've heard that quoted before? Okay, well, at least I know a few of y'all have been here because I've probably quoted it several times just at the drive-in worships. I love that verse. I, 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 love, I love what that verse says. And, and I use it quite often. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But it is right here in 1 John chapter 4 that we get that quote from John. That the Holy Spirit initiated that in him. As he's writing this letter, most likely to these churches over in Asia Minor. So let's look at the sort of verse in context. And let's talk a little bit tonight uh, about what it actually means. Beloved. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is, uh, it, that does not, confess Jesus is not from God. This is the Spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us, by this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So right here, John, uh, just so you know, this is the same John that wrote the Gospel of John. This is the same John that ends up writing Revelation. And at this point in his life, John is very old. In fact, history tells us that he was the last living, the last living apostle, the last living really eyewitness so with all the eyewitnesses of Jesus, you know, when Jesus resurrected, there were all these eyewitnesses. They believed that John was the last of all of them. And so as you get to this letter, this letter was probably written about 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus. John was probably really, really, really old. But he had a great relationship with Jesus when Jesus was here in his ministry. Remember, John's the one that... he. John was leaning up against Jesus. John was the one that outran Peter to the tomb. John was the one that Jesus entrusted his mother to as he was dying. This is John, and this is the same John right here. John, he is John. He is the brother of James, the son of Zebedee, which means the son of thunder. That's John. The, the churches in this day, John, because everybody else, you know, when you talk about Paul and you talk about Peter and you talk about those other great leaders they're all gone they've all died and so John's the last one and so the churches really relied on his wisdom they really relied on his instruction and his teaching and his guidance they say that he he was probably stationed at the church in Ephesus but he would be writing these letters out to the churches in Asia Minor. And so he was sort of that sort of senior pastor, senior elder that, were, that was over these church, just as churches, you know, sort of trying to take care of them. You know, we, we think that nowadays these big churches, they're the first one to come up with satellite churches, but they really weren't. They had them back then. They just couldn't Facebook live it. 
But John, he was sort of over all of those churches and they were looking for his instruction. So he's writing to them at this point and he's telling them about some things that they need to watch out for. I mean, when you really get in here and you look at even chapter three and then you start going into chapter four, he's really talking a whole lot about love and about loving each other and about how love identifies Christians uh, as really children of God. One of my favorite scriptures is right there in 1 John chapter 4. I used to know a song that would go along with it, but it's 1 John chapter 4 verse 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God and he that loves God know, uh, he that loves God knows God, but he that does not love God does not know him. That is 1 John 4 7 and 8. And so he, he is talking a lot about loving, but he is really talking also a lot about identifying, identifying who true believers are. And in this specific text right here, that's what's important is he wants them to learn to identify truth. And when we look at this and we look at this scripture really quick tonight, I just want to ask, what does this text mean to us? What, what do we learn? What does it show us right here? And the first thing I believe that jumps out to me is that we need to test what is true. We need to test what is true. The scripture says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. I want you to know we one of the things that's becoming very popular in our church age right now is we are becoming very spiritual okay and there's nothing wrong with that i believe um, i believe that as as being a, a baptist for many 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 years now one of the things that i've always really desired is for the baptist church itself to be become to come become more spirit sensitive is the way that i call it that, you know allowing the spirit to lead and guide you in your life not being afraid i mean when you hear that word holy spirit don't, don't get freaked out by it or when you hear the word holy ghost oh you know that's i mean that's the way it was it felt like when i was back 20 30 years ago as a teenager growing up in the church and, and so i had this longing really over the last 10 years and i think not just our church here, but the Baptist churches in general, I've seen have made strides in becoming what I call more spirit sensitive, actually allowing the spirit to lead. But I also see a shift and a change just in Christian churches in general, where they begin to over spiritualize everything. That everything, just over spiritualizing everything. And that can become dangerous. And what I believe right here, when we look at this, this is a warning that, hey, just because it sounds good, just because it looks good, just because it tastes good or feel good, doesn't mean it is good. Just because a man gets up with what looks like a Bible and has notes in it and gets up here and gives you an inspirational speech about what God wants to do for you and do with you and maybe even do through you doesn't necessarily mean that that's the spirit of God speaking to you. You've got to test the spirits, he was saying. Just, just because somebody comes and says something to you that you say, well, you know what? That makes sense to me. I never thought of it that way. Well, what does the Bible say? Have you ever thought about it that way? Because this right here, what we have, the word of God is to test those things. So we look at this and we, have, we realize that we have to test what is true we can't just go off of what we like to hear we can't just go off of what we think sounds good because then that is trying to justify things in our own mind saying well that makes sense you know the other that other thing doesn't make sense i don't know why the bible would say that this makes a lot more sense let me believe that but what we learn in Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 and 6 that we trust in the lord with all our heart but we lean not to our own understanding there are going to be things, I promise you, that you don't understand. But you can't go out there and just trust what any and everybody tell you. You've got to try for yourself to test it and try it. Get in the Word. Let the Spirit lead you. But find out and test and see if it's true. Because just because it looks good and sounds good doesn't mean it is. The Apostle Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, 
that even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. What that reminds me is, is that it's Satan himself, he, you know, we always have these pictures of pitchforks and horns and really evil things. And we get that kind of stuff because you go and you start reading about the seven headed dragons and stuff in Revelation. And, you know, we get these pictures and images and we think, but Satan actually disguises himself as an angel of light. Something beautiful, something appealing. Wouldn't be tempting if it wasn't appealing, would it be? And so he makes it where it looks good and it sounds good and it is appealing. And then we begin to think, well, maybe if it is good, it's from God. Maybe if I think it's good or if it feels good to me, it is from God. The Bible also tells us that your heart is deceiving among all things. We don't go off feelings. We test the spirits. We test it to see if it's true. You know, sort of like if you want to, if you had a big old diamond ring and you took it into the pawn shop because you needed money. I promise you that that, that pawn, the, the guy behind the desk at the pawn shop, or if you take it into a jeweler, he's not just going to look at it. Huh, looks good. I'll take it. Here's $2,000. No. He's going to break out every single tool he can to authenticate the value of that diamond. And I want you to understand today what John is saying is we need, no matter what, no matter who's bringing you the word, whether it's me or the guy down the street or the guy on the television, no matter who's bringing the word to you, you need to check the value of it and make sure that it lines up with what the Word of God says and how the Spirit of God leads. And so we need to learn. What we learn is that we need to test what is true, but we also need to uh, recognize that evil is active. Evil is active. As you sit in your vehicles right now, or as you sit at home and watch on Facebook, evil is active in this moment right now it is active in this moment in the things that are happening in the things that are going on around us satan is constantly trying to scheme he is constantly trying to work he is constantly trying to attack in first john john's writing to these churches and he's telling them beloved do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from god because many false prophets have gone into the world by this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus has come in the flesh from God. And every spirit, get this, that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. I'm going to stop there for a moment because I know y'all love that word. I mean, as soon as somebody spits out that word Antichrist, it's like, whoo, here goes Revelation! Yeah, if you get into the scripture, John's really the only one that uses that word antichrist. It kind of, you know, he, he, he sort of, he's the one that came up with that. I mean, actually all it means is somebody that opposes or a spirit that opposes Jesus Christ. He is an antichrist. He is against Jesus and who Jesus is and what Jesus stands for. That is the antichrist. That is an antichrist spirit. Now there is, and John talks about an individual that will one day, when we get into the end times, when God has taken his church out of this world and tribulation and judgment come down, what we find out in the midst of that is that there will be an antichrist. Who is he? Who is that antichrist? He is the one that's going to pretend to be Jesus. He's going to try to control the world and pretend to be the Savior. But he's not going to stand for anything that God stands for. He's going to try to manipulate people. He is going to try to fake them out. He is not real. He is against who Jesus is. And so when you look at this, it's funny because it always happens. I mean, you, every, every time there's a new president, it doesn't matter. Every time there's a new president... Uh, you know, if it's a Democratic president, all the Republicans are saying, oh, that's the Antichrist. <laughs> if they're Christian Democrats, they're saying, oh, that Republican's an Antichrist. 
You know, I mean, right now, who's the Antichrist? Oh, everybody thinks Bill Gates is. I mean, he might be, we don't know. <laughs> but here's the deal. The Antichrist is only the Antichrist, the one that is going to portray himself as the Savior when all literally hell breaks loose during the tribulation on this earth. Because when I say that, I'm saying it in context. Hell's going to break loose. Judgment's going to come down on the earth. And the Antichrist is going to step up that he is the Savior of the world. And he's not. That person, you think about it, Satan has to have somebody ready, right? Satan doesn't know when it's going to happen. Only God knows when the end of time is going to be. Only God knows that day. So what's interesting about this scripture, listen to what it says, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming and is already in the world. He was telling them that spirit of the Antichrist that is against Jesus that will indwell the person that ends up being that individual Antichrist was in the world at work in that moment through false teachers that were rejecting the true gospel. Evil is always at work around us. Everywhere we go, Satan, what, is, what does Peter say in chapter 5 verse 8 of 1 Peter? He says, hey, be of sober spirit and be on alert because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He is constantly at work trying to find people to manipulate and to attack and to go after. The, the, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 says this, finally be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. The Apostle Paul in that moment drops it down for the church in Ephesus and says, you got to be prepared because Satan is always at work and he is trying to do his best to destroy the church. And the best way to destroy the church is from within it. And so if he can attack his people, the people of the church, if he can attack those people, if he can get them to not be unified, if he can get them to have dissension within the church, if he can get them to start attacking their families at home, if he can start to create chaos, then we're in trouble. And so when, when this reminds us that evil is active and we start to talk about Antichrist, even for this church in Asia Minor, these churches that John's writing to, as he mentions this, those kind of things are scary. I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. I believe in the wickedness and I believe in evil spirits and I believe in their presence here right now. I believe that there's probably in the midst of our parking lot some sort of spiritual battle going on. It's probably happening in the backseat of some of your cars right now, and you don't even realize it. The spiritual realm is hard for us to imagine. But then when Scripture begins to make that spiritual realm come alive, and we realize that there are things that are, I mean, we're talking about strong, wicked forces in this world, and we can't see it, that becomes scary. That becomes very scary. And so, John, realizing that as he's talked about the Antichrist, and this is not the first time in 1 John that he mentions the Antichrist. You can go back to chapter 2. He's already sort of talked about it. He realizes that this probably is going to generate some fear. He realizes that as he talks about these live spirits within the world that are active and are manipulating people to become false teachers and teach against who Jesus truly is, that it begins to scare the flock there of Asia Minor. 
that they begin to get a little intimidated. Because when we start to think about the dark forces of the world, it can be intimidating. And most people may sit back and say, I can't handle that. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not biblically grounded enough. I'm not spiritually mature enough. I don't know what I'm going to do. And these people would have been the same way. And if this attack is coming at us and this antichrist that John has talked about isn't just coming, but he's here right now and he's working in this world, what are we going to do? And John says, well, you don't have to be scared. See, that's the, that's the last point I want you to understand. When you look at this text, the thing he tells them is there's no need. You don't need to fear. He says, you are from God, little children. If you sit in this parking lot right now, if you watch this on Facebook, and you call yourself a child of God, and John identifies what a true child of God is, by the way, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. He identifies that a child of God are only those who believe in Jesus Christ. Only those who have placed their faith in Jesus have the right. And when it says right, they have the right to become children of God. Only those have the right. That means not everybody has the right. You're not born with the right to be a child of God. You are given that right when you place your faith in Jesus Christ. When you believe that Jesus Christ is the one and only Son of God, born of a virgin, walked in flesh on the earth for 33 years, lived a sinless life, died on the cross to atone for your sins. He gave his blood so you could be forgiven. He was buried in a tomb. And on the third day, he rose again, just like he said he would. And you believe in that. John chapter 1 verse 12 says you have the right to be a child of God. And so right here in 1 John, probably decades later when he's writing to this church, he is telling them, oh, you little children of God. He's saying God is watching after you and taking care of you because you are one of his own. Yes, the forces of evil are active around you. Yes, the Antichrist spirit is alive in the world. But you, young little child of God... Greater is he in you than he that is in this world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's what John was trying to get across. That's what that statement means. That as the forces of darkness attack you, as they attack the church, as they attack your family, as the forces of darkness try to rain fear down in your life, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world that rains down fear. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world that is the spirit of the Antichrist. Greater is he that is in you than those that are the false teachers that are trying to hold you back, that are lying to you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But you must understand this one thing. In order to claim that, you've got to look at the first part of that and realize he said to them, you are of God, little children. You are his. And if you sit out there today and you can't truly say that, you can't say greater is he that is in you because you don't have him in you. I'm going to ask the band to come up and get ready for one last song. And as we sort of close this whole drive-in worship out and finish this out, that's my question for you. As you sit in your car, as you sit in, at home in your recliner, as you sit on the tailgate of your truck or in your lawn chair, can you truly, do you truly know that you are a child of God? Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you accepted the fact that he is the son of God? Have you accepted the fact that it is only through his blood atonement that you have forgiveness? Do you believe that he died and rose again on the third day and you have said, forgive me, Lord, and be my savior. I give my life to you. I turn from this world so that I can say greater is he who is in me than he who is in this world. Listen, if you're, if you're here, if you're listening, if you hear my voice, 
and you say, I want that, I want that confidence. I want that assurance, Pastor, that I know that Jesus Christ is my Savior, that I can claim greater is He that is in me. I want that. Here's what I want you to do. I want everybody, I want you in your cars, at home, I want you just to bow your heads right now. Listen, if you can say this, if you can say this with a, with a, absolutely, if you can say this, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If you can say that with confidence, then right now with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I ask you to pray. I'm going to assume if I can see you, if your head's bowed, your eyes aren't closed and you're not praying, that most likely then you can't say that. And if that's you, if you say, Pastor, I can't say that, I do get scared. This whole Antichrist thing freaks me out and I don't want to be freaked out. I want to know Jesus. I want to give my life to the Lord. Then where you sit right now, the first thing you need to recognize is who you are. And who you are is just like me, a sinner that falls short of the glory of God. And just like me, your sins have to be paid for. And the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Your sins must be paid for, but Jesus paid for them on the cross. If you believe that, and you believe that he rose again on the third day and he lives, and you truly, truly want him to be your Lord and Savior, then with your head bowed right now, your eyes closed, I want you in your heart to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. It can be something as simple as, Lord Jesus, I need to be forgiven. and I need you in my life. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose again. And I believe you can save me. And I cry out to you right now. And I ask you to save me. It can be that simple. You can do that right now. Heavenly Father, God, I pray right now. I pray that those hearts right now that you are... Lord, convicting those hearts right now that, that are fearful because they don't know, they're not sure if they know you. Lord, I pray they feel the presence of the spirit of truth upon them right now. Lord, I pray no spirit of fear, no spirit of antichrist, no evil spirit will have any influence in this moment. But Lord, your truth, they will hear your truth from inside of them. Lord, and they will give their life to you. Lord, I pray that right now from their car or from their home, that they can cry out from within and say, Lord Jesus, save me. And Lord, I pray that when they do that, Lord, I pray that they will feel and acknowledge the spirit of truth that is inside of them. God, I pray this, and I pray this in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Listen. If you said a prayer from your car, from home, and you truly asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, we want to know about it. I specifically want to know about it because I want to pray for you. Because like I said, evil is active in the world. And Jesus was talking to, I mean, John was talking to Christians right here about how evil was active in their community. And if you just became a Christian, evil's still going to be active. And one of the ways to combat that is through prayer. And through friends that know Jesus and will pray for you. And I want to be that friend. I want to pray for you. And so I encourage you, find me on Facebook. Call me at the church. Figure out a way to let me know, whether you message me on Facebook or through the church email, let me know that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And that tonight, you became a child of God. We're going to sing this last song together. Because this is sort of the last time we're going to get to meet like this. And I encourage you, come meet with us on Sunday morning. Let's sing this one, one more time together.